Good morning again. I first apologize. I don't know French. Uh, and what's worse, I can't even speak English, I speak American, which is <laughs> the worst dialect of anything. Uh, so bear with me as I clumsily say words. Uh, I'm going to talk about open source this morning, uh, and the hardest part of a talk is titling it. So I started out uh, by saying, well, this is called misfeasance, and I was like, what the hell is misfeasance? First I was going to call this open source malfeasance. And then I looked up what malfeasance actually meant, and it said hostile, aggressive action taken to injure the client's interests. And that seemed a little bit too harsh for the morning talk. Uh, so, went to misfeasance, which is to take inappropriate action or intentionally incorrect advice. Most of my talks are at least incorrect advice, so this seems a little bit more appropriate. So, I'm going to talk about open source today, because I, I think open source should be a playground. It should be exploration. Uh, have some fun with it. And I think all too often we think that open source has to be like some enterprisey, ridiculous something rather. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, so a couple different things. If you're a newbie, if you've never committed to open source, I want you to commit to an open source project by the end of this talk. Uh, if anybody ever does that, that'll be awesome. And I will be proud of you. Um, but think about what can you commit to? Can you build a project in the future? Um, if you've done this before, uh, I want you to rediscover open source and get excited about this stuff again. Uh, a lot of the times, you know, you get caught up in actual work or, you know, other stuff around life. Like, I have to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to do open source this week. So think about how you can, you know, reintroduce open source into your lifestyle. So I'm Zach Coleman. Uh, I work for GitHub. This is from our dodgeball tournament. It was for charity, and it turns out if you do something for charity, you can put funny pictures of yourself in short shorts in front of a lot of people, and it's cool because it's for the children. Um, <laughs> And I work for GitHub. Uh, I'm San Francisco based, uh, and I'm a developer, and sometimes I talk about GitHub, but this talk is not really about GitHub. So, the first thing that I usually ask myself is how do you fake being an okay programmer? Um, because I think we're sort of all in this boat. You, know, you ask yourself, I'm a horrible programmer, now what? Uh, how can I fake this sort of thing? Um, and I think everybody is a horrible programmer because I've seen a lot of your code, and everybody's code is terrible. Um, <laughs> So it's important to realize that open source is a really scary jump. It's, it's just frightening to get into, it's frightening to keep contributing to open source sometimes, but I mean, like everything else, you don't have to be smart to be successful. Um, I just, usually I give this talk in America and I say, this is America, damn it, because you know, there's lots of non-smart people who are successful. <laughs> but you know, it's probably the same out here, everybody has their successful dumb people. But it's all right. I think open source is very much like being an adult. Uh, it's very magical until you realize that nobody knows what the hell they're doing. Uh, I talk to a lot of people who are in charge of really big open source projects, and when you talk to them, you realize you know, they're not really any different from me. They just happen to be in charge of a really popular project. Um, so the question is, how do you fake being smart? I'm a really horrible programmer. How do I look smart enough to, to be cool with open source projects and everyone is impressed by me? Uh, and the answer is you don't. Like, you, you can't really fake being it. Um, I have a couple of really interesting examples from my own uh, personal experiences. I have this one project called Spark. Um, and it was written in shell script, and basically what you do is you give it a bunch of data on the command line, and it would make a bunch of, uh, like a Spark chart. It's basically a, a quick bar chart of what the data looks like. Pretty cool. Uh, the problem is I had no idea what a bash shell is when I wrote this. I mean, I, I knew a little bit of bash, but I mean, it, bash is, nobody actually knows any bash when you get down to it. So it was really confusing for me. Um, and the weird thing is, I got like 1,500 stars within a week or something on this, because people tended to really like this dumb little tool I wrote. Um, there are a lot of interesting things I realized from this. One, people are really good at fixing your mistakes, um, and then telling you exactly why you're wrong. And, and then they'll call you names, and then they'll make fun of your language. If you're using Bash, they'll say, I can do this in Ruby in one line. If you use Ruby, they'll say, I can do this in something that's actually fast. Uh, there's nothing you're going to do right in open source, which is a little bit depressing. But start viewing this as an advantage. Uh, yeah, people are kind of horrible online, but if you can take this to heart and actually use it to improve your own software, uh, this is actually a good thing. You have all of these people online just waiting to tell you everything you're doing wrong. Like, that's kind of amazing. You can't usually get that in normal day-to-day -day life. Um, and just kind of with everything in life, you end up learning more and more, and then you fake it less and less. Uh, before I knew it, I, you know, I contributed a bunch of projects, and I was like, wow, that's actually not that hard. You just go step by step. Um, I think there's a lot of really interesting asset, or, uh, aspects of open source. 
What I think is the long tail, which is really fascinating. Um, another project I had uh, called Fatigue, it basically it was for runners. Um, I used to run with Nike Plus, the little, uh, you, know, you run it on your iPhone and then you run and it keeps track of how long you went and you know, all that sort of fun stuff. Then I switched to Garmin, which was uh, more precise, more interesting. Um, so it was a running tool for uh, basically to import my data between the two services. Um, the problem is outdoor activities, I think, just frighten nerds. They just, you know, what am I going to do with running? So this was slightly different from Spark. It got like 16 people. Um, but, you know, that's, that's totally cool. Like, this is one of my favorite projects I've ever done because it ended up targeting a different subset of people than the normal crew of just open source people. And to this day, I still get a lot of emails from people who have never run a command line interface app at all. And, you know, they're getting exposed to this because I wrote something really dumb that I thought was helpful for me. Um, so exploit your hobbies. That, that, I think, is the best part. Um, a lot of the times the question is like, yeah, I want to get into open source, but what do I do? What do I focus on? Uh, and I think hobbies are really good because it's sort of that long tail. Like, it's not, you know, some ridiculous thing that everybody's done before. So think about, like, if you're big into photography, what can you write to help automate that? If you're big into music, if you're big into, like, geocaching or art, or, like, forging checks, or voter fraud, or, you know, knitting. <laughs> You know, all these sorts of things, like, think about, like, what do you like to do, and how can you automate that? We're in a really interesting position where we have, like, this magical power that the rest of the world can't do. Like, we can automate things using computers. Uh, it's amazing. So start thinking about, like, what all these other people in your hobbies that you love uh, can't do themselves. Um, and, you know, if your hobbies don't include another testing framework for whatever the hot thing is. Like, there's enough of those. Like, find an actual hobby. Uh, I should just do a talk about finding hobbies. Hobbies are good. Um, but basically, I think this is a really high impact effort. Uh, with, um, with fatigue, like, it only took me a day or so to write really terrible screen scraping code, because none of that stuff had APIs. Um, but the, the resulting impact of that was really, really high. And, and if you go into these sort of hobbies that not a lot of people have automated before, um, it doesn't take a lot of effort to really change people's uh, you know, lives, I guess, in a really cliche way. Like, this can actually impact people and make their lives better. Um, I want to talk about a bunch of different things, kind of exploiting open source. I want to talk about, first, for your own sort of pleasure, happiness, stuff like that. Um, one, burnout. Don't burn out. Our industry is not really good at this. I think uh, oh, there's a lot of programmers who get really angry and then post things on the internet because they're so burnt out on you know, just technology in general. Something I say a lot is I think code is a really creative endeavor. Uh, we like to think that it's very logical and if statements and then and while loops and stuff. Uh, but when you get down to it, it's very creative. You have to figure out, you know, it's, it's problem solving at its core. How do I make this faster? How do I make this with less lines of codes? How do I make this clean and elegant? And that's a very creative process to go through. You can't just sit down and say, all right, I'm going to slant home these lines of code and expect them to be perfect. You have to be in the right mindset to do this sort of stuff. And I think open source is a really good breather. Uh, it's, it's a nice break away from work if you're doing this full time. Uh, for a lot of different ways, or a lot of different reasons. One is just learning. You're learning a bunch of stuff. Uh, forcing yourself to try new techniques uh, and new languages. I think this is a really good way for open source. Like, um, pick like something that you would, pick a project that you want to work on something that is interesting to you, and then force yourself to try a different language, or a different framework, or a different whatever. And, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it may take you a lot longer, but by forcing yourself to try something new, it's, it's much more interesting. And it's not necessarily about the speed of how you can build something, or how interesting it is. Like, sometimes it's just about forcing yourself to do something new. And open source is great, because nobody's ever gotten fired for pushing open source. Um, I don't know if that's actually true, uh, but I hope that's not true, or I hope that's true. Um, so that's good. You have some freedom. Like, you know, you can get fired for pushing crap code to production at work, but you can do whatever the hell you want in open source. And again, I've seen a lot of open source code, and people have done whatever the hell they want in open source, for better and worse. Um, so it's good. Another aspect of sort of personal happiness with stuff is fame and glory. Um, and fame and glory makes people uncomfortable sometimes, especially if you want to be a stereotypical nerd. Nerds tend to be more introverted and stuff, which are great qualities to have. Um, but you know, the reality is your clout score really matters. Um, I'm totally just kidding. Your clout score doesn't matter. But uh, publicity really helps. And I think um, this is something that isn't embraced enough, I think, in open source. Um, and the reason why I say this is I don't think you don't know what you're going to launch tomorrow. And 
that depends on you know what you want to call launching, but that could be you know a new career, a new job, that could be an actual company, that could be another open source project down the road. And if you start building this sort of uh, idea of who you are online through like a blog post or open source contributions or you know whatever it ends up being, giving talks at conferences, um, I think that just helps you because you get a bunch of contacts and then you can help launch whatever you want to launch down the line. Um, it's it's just a smarter way to look at things. I also want to talk about a little bit of open source about for business because you guys are all business minded and this is very businessy, something like that. Um, if you look at the open source, you know, or the Fortune 100 open source, um, I'm just kidding. I don't want to talk about the Fortune 100 because it's really boring to me because they're really old and you know big companies and stuff. I want to talk about how do real businesses do open source? Uh, I guess. <laughs> um, one I thought was really interesting was 37 Signals puts their entire API on GitHub. Um, so you can see that they have example code that you can check out of um, how to interact with the API. Uh, it's all completely versioned, so you can see explicitly how somebody changes the API at 37 Signals for all of their products. Um, and it's very diffable. So you can click on, oh yeah, you know, so-and-so just changed a commit in the API, let me see what actually changed. Oh, it's a different response type, I have to change that in my apps. Um, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and they do this all on GitHub. They don't even have a separate docs uh, uh, website for their, their stuff, um, which is crazy because GitHub doesn't even do that, and we tend to use GitHub a lot. Um, so that's really interesting. Like, what can you put on GitHub? What can you put on open source that will make everyone's lives a lot easier? Um, another example of this is GitHub Services. It's one of our repos at GitHub. And this is all of your webhooks and stuff. When you push code, uh, these go out to track or email or IRC notifications. Um, we support hundreds of services, and I mean, the hint is we no way would we have ever built this ourselves at GitHub uh, because we would have had to maintain you know a hundred some services internally and make sure they all work and stuff. But open source is a great example for our business. Like we don't have to worry about this. We just let it go out there, and people fix it and maintain it, um, and it's been really good for us to do that. Uh, I also want to talk about some open source tricks. Because if you had tricks in a talk title or a slide, like everyone gets excited, like, oh, tricks and secrets and fun. Um, so I do this a lot. You know, in this case, I merged a pull request on a particular project, and you know, it's one, you know, one commit, one addition, one deletion. Not a big deal. For me, in open source, this is something that I do from time to time, and it's just not crazy to me. But imagine yourself if this is your commit that I just merged, uh, and you've never interacted with open source ever before. They don't end up seeing this screen, they end up seeing something like that. <laughs> and they're so excited. Like, this is something that people don't realize. Like, open source is exciting and frightening and terrifying for the first time if you've never done it before. Um, and I think a lot of maintainers get really jaded. Well, it's just like, oh man, uh, there's another pull request, you know, denied, and it, it's really depressing. Um, your pull, pull request is really sacred. And I think that's a good thing to keep in mind. Like, don't ruin someone's first time. Uh, I mean, think back to the first time you had your pull first pull request merge. Like, the first time I tried to work in open source, I sent a, uh, a diff to somebody else in the Rails community, and I was like, check this out, this would be great. And he said, no. And then I worked for them, like, two years later at GitHub, which was really awkward, because I'm like, you just... You destroyed my first time, and I'm really sad about this. But it's alright, I forgave him, and it was probably crappy code anyway, so that's fine. Anyway, what were we talking about? Uh, so yeah, in this case, it's again, just one commit of maybe a typo change. It's something that you can easily shrug off as, you know, um, not a big deal, but think of how much work it takes to get to the point of just making a typo change. You have to pull down a repo, you have to figure out how Git works, you have to make commits, push it back up, send a pull request. There's a lot of knowledge involved, and it's really frightening for first-timers to jump into this. Um, so just recognize that open source is scary, and just being helpful leads to more contributions. The number of times, you know, something that I would merge is really, you know, dumb and minor and stuff, like a documentation change. I'll merge it, and that alone is not necessarily something crazy or groundbreaking. And then the fact that he was able, or he or she was able to get into my project and start contributing, gets them really excited to do that in the future. Then I'll see the more contributions from them, and then a week or two later I'll start seeing you know, substantial changes, which are awesome. And that all stems from just being really, you know, fostering a really good environment early on. Um, and I think open source does this kind of terribly in a lot of different ways. Pop quiz, do you know what the best GitHub event is? And by this I mean on your dashboard, which type of event would come by? 
Uh, rhetorical question. The answer is this one. So-and-so open source, so-and-so repo. Uh, I think this is like the best event ever because it basically means you go from a private repository to a public repository. In other words, you go from a finished repository to a publicized repository. Uh, this is important because I think repositories just with a readme are really sad. Every now and then, like, I'll search for, like, you know, something that will make Ruby really fast, and then this repository comes up on a, a search listing, and I'm like, yes, click on it, and then it's just an empty repo saying, someday I'm going to make this repository fast. And it's just like, oh, man. I love it when it's just, like, tidy and ready to go, and I can just click install, and it just goes. Um, I love the reveal, basically. And this is sort of the same thing in business. Uh, this is why you have product launches. This is why you publicize things. Um, there's no reason you can't do this in open source, too. Work on this for a couple weeks or a month and then just reveal it uh, and start publicizing it as a product. I think that's exciting. I think that encourages sharing and tweeting and, you know, Facebook like plus one G share to friendship to Shane invite. In, ah, damn it. I still can't finish that. Uh, all of the social media stuff. People get excited when they say, oh man, this just solves all my problems and it's totally done. I don't have to wait a couple months until maybe the guy decides to finish it. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, I also want to talk about docs first development uh, because I think documentation really increases your code quality. Uh, I'm just kidding. I don't care about code quality whatsoever. <laughs> I think code quality is kind of a myth and it's hilarious to watch bad code. Um, what I mean by this is I think readme's, bootstrap scripts, making issues means less work for you. So the more documentation you write, the less work you have to do. Uh, and we're all really lazy people, so that's really good stuff. Um, so help people help you. Uh, traditionally, with a lot of people, and me included for sure, uh, you, know, you tend to want to jump into the really interesting problems first and say, well, you know, I really want to you know, do this problem first, and then at the end of it I'll go back and write the bootstrap script, you know, installing all the dependencies, like help scripts on how to contribute and stuff, uh, and that really sucks. And there's been a number of times where you know I'll just make like 20 issues just for myself, and then before I know it, somebody else had seen those issues and just built the work for me. And that's great. Like if you can start documenting stuff up front, just describing the problem, that encourages people to help you out before you even know you need help. Um, along those lines, I really love pointless code. I think pointless code is amazing. Uh, at some point, I swear I will push code that looks like this. And this is Ruby, but you should be able to figure it out. Uh, a method called encrypt, and you pass in a password into that, and then you write 50 lines of crazy string mutation code, and then at the end you just return the original password. Um, I, just, I just love the idea of some security guy coming in and just like flipping out over this, like that's not security and stuff. It, it, whenever you control security people, is just, it's, it's fun. Because they're just absolutely frightening people in general, and you know, it, it's fun. Um, basically what I mean by this is it's important to play, and I think it's, it's fascinating to figure out, um, you know, creative ways of just playing with code, because we're, I mean, we're ridiculous, like, we can just, like, think up a cool idea in the shower and then build something that afternoon, like, we can create worlds if you want to be, like, that crazy about it. Um, I think it's, it's fun to sort of step back and say, hey, maybe we, we can do something fun, too. Uh, a really great example of this recently is something called GIF sockets. It's uh, real-time communication using animated GIFs. Um, it turns out, you can just, uh, so this does this by pushing text into frames and then pushing it to the client frame by frame. It turns out um, browsers will start rendering a animated GIF frame by frame as they get the frames from the, the server. Um, so you can just slowly just push text rendered onto a JPEG inside of a GIF and then send it to the server, or send it to the client, and then you can actually you know, communicate with the user that way. Um, this is like one of those uh, you know, solutions in search of a problem. Uh, but I think it's hilarious. And this is something that, like, man, somebody sat down and, like, I'm gonna build this out. And I guarantee you, he learned a lot about the GIF spec by doing this. And it's, you know, no real use in society, but it's fascinating. I think it's, it's, it's funny. It made me laugh when I saw this. Uh, you know, stretch your mind. Think about, like, again, like, maybe sitting down on a project and using a language you've never used before. Yes, it's harder. Yes, it's gonna take you a lot longer, but, you know, it forces you to think in a different way. Or, you know, Figure out, I have an animated GIF, I have communication, how do I put these two together? Sometimes you end up with really interesting stuff. Also, it's just really funny. I, I like funny things, and I think that it's, I would like more funny things. So in general, uh, just build more fun into your stuff, uh, build more silly into your stuff, and just build more things. Uh, open source is kind of a fun way to do that. Uh, and I think that's the most exciting aspect of uh, what you can do as a program. So that's what I've got. Thanks.